It's been a busy year here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and let's bring you up to date on some of our current and future missions. JPL's Mars Phoenix lander is on course for touchdown on Martian soil May 25th. If successful, it'll be the first spacecraft to land in the Martian Arctic and the first to collect and analyze water ice from the surface of another planet. But before that, Phoenix will experience a harrowing seven minutes as it hurls through the Martian atmosphere to what we hope is a soft landing. The success rate of landing on Mars is only about 50 percent, which is why landing day for Phoenix is a guaranteed nail-biter. Phoenix is the first Mars down mission. It's the first mission that's going to try to land near the North Pole of Mars. And it's the first mission that's actually going to go try and reach out and touch water on the surface of another planet. Where there tends to be water, at least on Earth, there tends to be life. And so it's potentially a place where life could have existed on the planet in the past. The main purpose of EDL is to take a spacecraft that is traveling at 12,500 miles an hour and bring it to a screeching halt in a soft way in a very short amount of time. We enter the Martian atmosphere. We're 70 miles above the surface of Mars, and our lander is safely tucked inside what we call an aeroshell. Looks kind of like an ice cream cone, more or less. And on the front of it is this heat shield, this saucer-looking thing that has about a half inch of essentially what's cork on the front of it which is our heat shield. Now this is really special cork, and this cork is what's gonna protect us from the violent atmospheric entry that we're about to experience. Friction really starts to build up on the spacecraft, and we use the friction when it uh, is flying through the atmosphere to our advantage to slow us down. From this point, we're gonna decelerate from 12,500 miles an hour down to 900 miles an hour. The outside can get almost as hot as the surface of the sun. The temperature of the heat shield will reach 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. But the inside doesn't get very hot. Uh, it probably gets about room temperature. There is this window of opportunity in within which we can deploy the parachute. If you fire the chute too early, the parachute itself could fail. The fabric and the stitching could just pull apart. And that would be Bad. In the first 15 seconds after we deploy the parachute, we'll decelerate from 900 miles an hour to a relatively slow 250 miles an hour. We no longer need the heat shield to protect us from the force of atmospheric entry, so we jettison the heat shield, exposing for the first time our lander to the atmosphere of Mars. After the heat shield has been jettisoned and the legs are deployed, the next step is to have the radar system begin to detect how far Phoenix really is from the ground. We've lost 99% of our entry velocity. So we're 99% of the way to where we want to be. But that last 1%, as it always seems to be, is the tricky part. Now, the spacecraft actually has to decide when it's going to get rid of its parachute. We separate from the lander going 125 miles an hour at roughly a kilometer above the surface of Mars, 3,200 feet. That's like taking two Empire State Buildings and stacking them on top of one another. That's when we separate from the back shell and we're now in free fall. It's a very scary moment. A lot has to happen in a very short amount of time. So it's in a free fall, but it's also trying to use all of its uh, actuators to make sure that it's in the right position to land. And then it has to light up its engines, right itself, and then, and then slowly slow itself down and touch down on the ground safely. 
EDL is this immense technically challenging problem it's about getting a spacecraft that's hurtling through deep space and using all this bag of tricks to somehow figure out how to get it down to the surface of Mars at zero miles an hour. It's this immensely exciting and challenging problem. Meanwhile, what's happening with the Mars rover's spirit and opportunity? Well, the resilient rovers are still operating four years after landing on Mars for what was to be a three-month mission. Truth is, scary moments this past year have threatened to end the mission. Severe dust storms darkened the skies, making it difficult to get energy through the solar panels, and both rovers are showing their age. Opportunity's arm is giving it trouble, and Spirit's right front wheel has to be dragged along. But our engineers have developed ways to keep them going. In fact, if Spirit's broken wheel hadn't been churning up the soil, scientists wouldn't have spotted silica and salts associated with water. So the rovers persevere. Spirit is wintering on a north-facing slope, trying to get as much sun as possible on its dust-covered solar panels and opportunity is inside the magnificent Victoria Crater. From above, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is also taking amazing high-resolution pictures, including the first-ever image of active avalanches. These were taken near the red planet's North Pole. And from the poles of Mars to Earth poles, NASA and international space agencies are collaborating to study our polar regions. Observations by satellites as well as on the ground have shown that the huge expanses of Greenland and Antarctica are melting away in response to climate warming. Ice melt raises sea level and the impact on coastal areas could be devastating. JPL's Ocean Surface Topography mission, Jason-2, will be an ocean watcher. It'll monitor sea level rise, ocean circulation, and climate change. As most people know, a uh, majority of the Earth is covered by the oceans. They store a majority of the heat that we get and, and in that respect, uh, interact with the climate. The ocean is a big sink for heat. It can uh, absorb heat from the atmosphere, so uh, if we uh, continue to warm the atmosphere through increasing carbon dioxide or, or uh, other factors, the ocean will uh, absorb that heat and store it and it can store up to 80% of that heat, but the question is, uh, will it keep doing that in the future? Well, the Ocean Surface Topography Mission is important because it provides a, uh, a view of the changing climate. It monitors the consequences of global climate change and global warming by monitoring uh, sea level rise. Half the world population lives within 100 kilometers from the coast. Sea level is rising at three millimeters per year. The ice sheet of Antarctica and Greenland each has a capacity of raising sea level by meters. They're gonna inundate most of Florida, gonna inundate Manhattan. It's measuring the height of the ocean surface to a few inches from 800 miles above the surface of the Earth. Imagine my hand here is the spacecraft and this ball is the pulse of energy, radar energy that it sends to the surface. What it does is it measures the amount of time for it to come back. If the ocean surface is lower, which is represented by this lower step here, it takes a longer amount of time to come back than if it were higher. The radar altimeter uh, sends a, a pulse of microwave energy down to the surface and measures the amount of time it takes to get back. It continues the measurements that were started in 1992 by Topex Poseidon and continued with the Jason-1 satellite. And now we have the OSTM, which is going to continue this record into the future and will help us answer questions like, is sea level rise going to accelerate? OSTM is going to be able to provide us some of the key information to understanding and predicting and tracking hurricanes. It's going to be able to provide us the uh, same kind of information for oil rigs, for shipping, for fisheries management. And those are some of the very practical applications besides just the long-term uh, monitoring of climate. It will really give us day-to-day -day applications where we're able to improve our weather forecasting. The Ocean Surface Topography Mission is scheduled for launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base 
on June 15. Six months later, another satellite, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, is scheduled for launch. OCO will measure our planet's carbon dioxide levels from space. Let's turn now to a spacecraft that's been in orbit around the ring planet for nearly four years. 